He has been referred to as the King of the Beats. The staple the Beats has even been attributed to him, though many argue otherwise. He was praised and scorned, ridiculed and misunderstood. His bragging about having created the original manuscript in only three weeks would prompt Truman Capote to famously say, that isn't writing, it's typing. Nevertheless, despite the controversy, despite the criticism and the barrage of questions which would follow, Kerouac's On the Road would become a tremendous success. With it, he went deep into the myth of the American hobo, a figure that represented a freedom, a freshness, a mobility, and detachment from a world scrambling for power and prestige. In essence, the book presented a dream that many wanted to live but were too afraid to explore themselves. The book gave them insight. The America Kerouac portrayed in On the Road was a completely different country from President Eisenhower's America at the time. The novel appeared to be a traveler's tale from an alternate nation with the same language, cities, highways, and movie stars that its readers were familiar with, but separated in some important way from what drove most Americans in the 1950s. Protagonist Dean Moriarty took a job only as a last resort, and Sal Paradise wanted nothing more from his work than food for the night or a bus ticket to take him someplace else. It was a fantasy many wanted to live, and which they almost could, through the book. With positive reviews following the publication, and with a popular and handsome writer that everyone wanted to interview, it seemed destined to become iconic. Which is fair to say it has, since we are still talking about it 65 years after its release. Welcome to House of Words a podcast about writers, travelers, and the exploration of freedom. I am your host, Jason Nemoore Hardin, and today we're exploring Jack Kerouac's most famous novel, On the Road. The first edition of On the Road was published in September 1957. This following statement was on the back cover of that edition. They rushed down the street together, digging everything in the early way they had, which later became so much sadder and perceptive and blank. But then they danced down the streets like dingledodies, and I shambled after as I've been doing all my life after people who interest me. Because the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time, the ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, 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 like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. And in the middle, you see the blue center light pop, and everybody goes, ah, oh, wanting dearly to learn how to write like Carlo. The first thing you know, Dean was attacking him with a great amorous soul such as only a con man can have. Now, Carlo, let me speak. Here's what I'm saying. I didn't see them for about two weeks, during which time they cemented their relationship to fiendish, all-day, all-night talk proportions. Then came spring, the great time of traveling, and everybody in the scattered gang was getting ready to take one trip or another. I was busily at work on my novel, and when I came to the halfway mark after a trip down south with my aunt to visit my brother, Rocco, I got ready to travel west for the very first time. Quote, Live, travel, adventure, bless, and don't be sorry. End quote. Jack Kerouac was born Jean-Louis Lebris de Kerouac in Lowell, Massachusetts on March 12, 1922. His parents, Leo and Gabrielle, had both immigrated from Quebec to the U.S. before they met and married and subsequently moved to the French-Canadian neighborhood of Lowell. In their house, they would speak the French-Canadian dialect of Joël, and Kerouac wouldn't learn to speak English fluently until the age of six when he began attending provincial school. In 1939, 
Kerouac graduated from Lowell High School as a star athlete, winning a football scholarship to Horace Mann Preparatory School and Columbia University. He played football as a Columbia freshman, but dropped out after quarreling with his coach his sophomore year. At 19 years old, he embraced his own independence and decided not to finish college. He wanted to become an adventurer, a lonesome traveler, all in order to become a great American novelist in the tradition of Jack London and Thomas Wolfe. His first novel would be written while he was working as a merchant during World War II. It was called The Sea is My Brother, which he finished in 1943, but would go unpublished. He became even more determined to be a writer after becoming friends with a group of people around the Columbia campus, who would later be referred to as the Beat Writers some of which appear in On the Road, although under different names. Like many young adults, Kerouac would divide his time between experimenting with his Columbia friends, drinking, marijuana, morphine, and benzedrine, while keeping up the act as the good boy to his parents. The act would, however, reach an abrupt end when he became involved in a manslaughter case when his friend stabbed another young man to death. Jack was subsequently arrested as a material witness for not reporting the homicide. While in jail, his father refused to put up the $100 to bail his son out, telling him that he disgraced the family name. This would linger with him for quite some time. His friend Edie Parker came up with the money, but under the condition that he first marry her in City Hall. Thus, he was released from jail and soon a married man although they would separate soon after. Becoming more and more invested in his writing, he soon found that Benzedrine was a great way to get the energy he needed to write without becoming fatigued. Unfortunately, his use would become excessive and would bring on an attack of phlebitis, which landed him in the hospital. After leaving the hospital, Jack would stay with his parents in order to nurse his father, who was suffering from cancer. Leo Kerouac would succumb to his disease in 1946. Grief-stricken, Jack decided to embark on what he referred to as a huge novel explaining everything to everybody. He hoped it would redeem him in the view of the family. His mother, whom he called Mermer, would continue to work at her factory job in order for her son to be able to write the novel, which he titled The Town and the City. That same year, 1946, he would meet the person who'd become one of the most important people in his life, the person he would use to create the character Dean Moriarty in On the Road, Neil Cassidy. Kerouac had read letters Cassidy had sent to a friend of his before his arrival and was curious about him. Cassidy had grown up in Denver, Colorado, living with his alcoholic father in Skid Row Hotels. In his teenage years, he'd served time in the reformatory for stealing cars and taking joyrides. There in the prison library, he encountered the Harvard classics and decided he wanted to attend Columbia. Cassidy would, however, give up those plans after meeting Allen Ginsberg and Jack. He decided that he was to become a writer by learning from them instead. In late 1946... Kerouac was stricken with thrombophlebitis, a blood-clotting disorder which in Jack's case was confined to his legs. His legs would become enormously swollen and tender during an attack. The affliction was painful and persistent, and it brought the threat of clots that could potentially reach his brain or his heart and ultimately kill him. With this shadow of death persistently over him, his hunger to see the world outside of New England and New York, would grow. After two years of writing the highly autobiographical novel, The Town and the City, he completed it in May 1948. He had taken the style and structure from the Thomas Wolfe novel, Look Homeward, Angel. Although he did find publication in 1950, the reviews were only cordial and in the end, it sold very poorly. Not achieving the returns one could hope for, he would remain dependent on his mother's income. He attempted to write the earliest of his so-called road adventures in July of 1947, while
while simultaneously writing the town and the city, a feat he found himself overwhelmed by. However, once finished with his first novel, he would shortly thereafter begin writing one of the earliest versions of On the Road. Quote, You can't live in this world, but there's nowhere else to go. End quote. In the earliest version of On the Road, he used what he called a factualist or naturalist way of handling his ideas, in imitation of Theodore Dreiser, whose novels he was reading at the time. An early journal entry tells us that Kerouac was writing with enthusiasm and productivity, and by November 29, 1948, he testified to have written approximately 32,500 words since he first began on November 9th. He goes on to write, I delight in the figures, as always, because they are concrete evidence of a greater freedom in writing than I had in town and city. After a month of working on the manuscript, he reached a dead end, feeling, as he said, an emptiness and even falseness when he sat down to write. Furthermore, he expressed disappointment in the new style he had chosen as it failed to express the, quote, reverent mad feelings he had been able to tap into in what he considered to be the best passages of his prior novel. Then, around Christmas 1948, Neil Cassidy arrived at Jack's sister's house in North Carolina, which provided the perfect excuse for him to take some time away from the novel. Jack jumped into Cassidy's new car, a Hudson, and they drove cross-country together. This adventure would become the basis of part two of On the Road. Upon returning to his mother's place in February 1949, he felt so shattered by weeks of being on the road with Cassidy that he decided the factualist novel, as he called it, was not to be. Instead, he began on another project, this one called A Novella of Children and Evil, The Myth of the Rainy Night, which would many rewrites later become Dr. Sachs. He, however, could not let go of the concept behind On the Road and outlined ambitious new plans for the book that was now officially called On the Road. At this stage, he envisioned it as a quest novel in the vein of Cervantes' Don Quixote or John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. He abandoned his earlier hero whom he had named Ray Smith in favor of a narrator he called Smitty, who would play the role of Sancho Panza to the central character, Red Moultrie. He filled his journal with pages of notes describing his ideas for developing the characters and themes of this version of On the Road. But what really stood out was his descriptions of the crazy jazz he was listening to at the time. Quote, I don't care what anybody says. I'm pulled out of my shoes by wild stuff like that pure whiskey. Let's hear no more about jazz critics and those who wonder about Bob. I like my whiskey wild. I like Saturday night in the shack to be crazy. I like my tenor to be woman mad. I like things to go and rock and be flipped. I want to be stoned if I'm going to be stoned at all. I like to be gassed by a back alley music. End quote. Despite the newly found inspiration, the progress would be put aside once again in April 1949 when he learned that his book, The Town and the City, had been accepted by a publisher under the condition that he trimmed the 1,100-page manuscript. Kerouac took the advance money, moved to Denver, and got to work. Already by June 1949, he would be back to writing on the road. In the process, he commenced writing a 700-word description of how the hero of the story, Red, spends his last night in jail before hitting the road. Then came another roadblock, as he felt once again dissatisfied with how the novel was progressing. He felt it lacked the freshness and spontaneity of the jazz writings he'd scribbled in his journals on inspired nights. It felt like a better choice to drop the novel altogether and join Neil Cassidy in San Francisco which would later become part three of the published novel. In May of 1950, after the publication of The Town and the City, Kerouac returned to Denver, hoping to overcome his writer's block. 
Before he made significant progress, however, Cassidy came rushing back in and scooped him away on a trip to Mexico, which became the basis for part four of the book. Upon returning from Mexico, it took him a while to get over the heavy drugs he had taken while there, which undoubtedly wreaked havoc on him. Once he was ready to write again, there he was sitting in the kitchen of his mother's new apartment in Ozone Park, where he kicked off a fresh new start with a story about hitchhiking cross-country, using a ten-year-old black child as his narrator. This was a story Kerouac would later revisit towards the end of his life, calling it Pick. Reading segments of William Burroughs' very autobiographical novels, Junkie and Queer, Kerouac was impressed with the honesty in his narration. However, it was the letters that Cassidy would send Allen Ginsberg at the time which inspired him the most. There was something in Cassidy's style of combining loose, rambling sentences with meticulously detailed observations regarding his sexual exploits that he felt was a fresh and new style he thought could fit his novel. Then on December 27, 1950, Jack's second wife, Joan, wrote to Neil that both she and Jack were stunned with a particular 13,000-word letter they'd received. Jack had spent two hours perusing it in a cafeteria and hadn't got home until 6 p.m., by which time she began reading the letter and dinner was delayed yet another hour. Neil could paint pictures with words like few others, and by the time Jack was done with the letter, he was convinced that it was among the best things ever written in America, period, and told Neil so when he wrote him back. In addition to being inspired by William Burroughs' Honest Prose and the Letters of Cassidy, Kerouac also had a strong reaction to another member of his group of friends, namely John Clallon Holmes. In March 1951, Holmes finished a novel he called The Beat Generation. The characters of said novel had been modeled on Holmes himself, his wife, Ginsburg, Kerouac, and Cassidy. Kerouac had fictionalized the wild activities of his New York friends in a section of the town and city, but Holmes went even further with the concept. In Holmes' book, whole conversations with Ginsburg and Kerouac were quoted verbatim. He used different names for them, of course, but the conversations were accurate to a T. A short time later, Holmes managed to find a publisher and got a $20,000 advance for the book which was then retitled, Go. Jack Kerouac was furious as well as jealous, though he never let that show, and he continued to support Holmes. Fueled by jealousy, but also greatly inspired by his friends, Jack decided to write on the road as if telling his then-wife Joan what had happened on his cross-country trips with Cassidy before their marriage. Using the first-person narrative like Burroughs, but also imitating Cassidy's confessional style, as well as using events and conversations from real life, at times verbatim, like Holmes, he revisited those earlier journeys. Now, being a rapid typist, he didn't like the idea of having to stop writing the story in order to change paper at the end of each page. He wanted the momentum to keep going by being able to type nonstop. In order to accomplish this, he taped together 12-foot-long sheets of drawing paper, trimmed at the left margin so they would fit into his typewriter, and fed them into his machine as a continuous roll. He wrote everything that occurred, using real names on the initial draft. He had an uncanny ability to disassociate himself from his fingers and simply follow the movie in his head, and doing so at an impressive pace. Holmes would visit Jack's apartment during the writing of this version of On the Road and would be amazed at the thundering sound of Jack's typewriter racing nonstop. He was taking Benzedrine to stay awake and keep writing, and Joan, who was working as a waitress at the time, would feed him pea soup and coffee when she got home. She was impressed with her husband's dedication, but also by the fact that he was sweating so much he was going through several t-shirts a day, so much so that damp t-shirts would be left hanging around the apartment to dry. At the center of the book, its energy is Neil. 
Neil driving, Neil stealing cars, Neil pushing the narrative forth. The book was very much a portrait of Neil, a man who was racing to make up for all the lost time in the world. This would later serve to encourage journalists to compare Kerouac to the character he had based on Neil, Dean Moriarty. Jack, to some extent, wished to have lived the life of Neil, and with the book, he did somewhat do that, although it would come with consequences. He began writing in early April of 1951. Writing with a ravenous hunger, he would write 34,000 words by April 9th. By April 20th, he had 86,000 words, and a week after that, on April 27th, the book was finished in the shape of a roll of paper typed as a single-spaced paragraph 120 feet long. He was ecstatic and gave thought to the notion that he had established a new trend in American literature. He would later boast about how he'd been on the road for seven years but needed only three weeks to write about it, something that would help build a mythos that would be impossible to shake off. The stresses and strains he experienced between the years 1948 and 1950 in his obsessive quest to find a way to write on the road were totally absent from the final product. In the novel, he portrayed himself as a naive young writer steadily getting on with the job at hand, who would get his first book published and additionally marry the girl of his dreams by the end of the book. Reality, however, was much different from this. By the end of the role that was to be the manuscript of On the Road, his wife Joan would leave him. His marathon typing during those three weeks in April of 1951 produced what he considered a final novel. He did, though, as one would guess, retype and revise the original manuscript several times. But as easy as it had been to write it, it would be far more difficult to get it published. From the time when the role version of On the Road was completed and the novel finally succeeded in getting published in 1957, books seemed to pour from him. Immediately following the completion of On the Road, he began writing Visions of Cody, which he completed sometime in 1952. Later that same year, he wrote Dr. Sachs. Book of Dreams was written between 1952 and 1960, Maggie Cassidy and the Subterraneans in 1953, Mexico City Blues in 1955, Tristessa, Visions of Gerald, and The Scripture of the Golden Entity, in addition to Part One of Desolation Angels, were all written in 1956. These are in addition to the books he wrote during this time that were never published. As early as March 1953, Viking Press editorial advisor and influential critic Malcolm Cowley was interested in On the Road, though nothing would come of it as Viking did not want the novel at the time. Instead, they offered a small advance for a paperback edition of the book Maggie Cassidy. Jack, being aware of the amount Holmes received as an advance for Go, felt so insulted and angered by the offer he received that he refused to negotiate with Viking. Cowley did, however, continue to champion him, and in 1954 his recommendation led to Kerouac's first publication in five years, an article entitled Jazz of the Beat Generation. He received $120 for it and insisted that it be published under the name Jean-Louis because he was fearful about his ex-wife suing him for support of their daughter if he used his real name. Cowley also persuaded him to retitle his novel On the Road after he had changed it to The Beat Generation. Kerouac would later claim that Cowley had taken advantage of him when he was at a low place in his career. After years of the novel going unpublished, Cowley thought the novel had structural problems and should be revised. Under Cowley's suggestions, Kerouac fused various trips and trimmed a lot of the content for the sake of focus. Then again in mid-December 1956, he again revised the book for Viking to remove all traces of what was feared would be libelous material. Finally acceptable to a publisher, it was accepted by Viking and scheduled for release in September 1957. 
He would not get final word on his book before he was sent advanced copies in July 1957. It was only then that he learned of additional cuts and changes made by an in-house editor at Viking. Shortly before midnight on Wednesday, September 4th, 1957, Jack Kerouac and Joyce Johnson, a young writer he was living with at the time, went to a newsstand on 66th Street and Broadway on the Upper West Side of New York City to wait for the latest edition of the New York Times to arrive by delivery truck. He had been told by his publisher that his novel, On the Road, was reviewed in the newspaper. They bought the first copy they could pull from the stack, and standing under a street lamp, they turned the pages until they found the column, Books of the Times. The review praised the book and went as far as calling Jack Kerouac the principal avatar of the Beat Generation. He and Joyce took the paper to a neighborhood bar, where they read and reread the review over and over again. Hours later, they returned to the apartment and went to bed. It would be the last time he would go to sleep as an obscure writer. By the next day, a world of attention was ready for him. He was 35 years old when On the Road was published. It had taken him a big slice of the first part of his career getting it published and would later spend the rest of his life trying to live it down. With the rise of Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Carl Solomon, and Neil Cassidy, the Beat Generation was hot in pop culture, and Kerouac was soon dubbed its chief incarnation. With the attention came a bombardment of questions. Instead of the intrigue being relevant to who he was or what he was trying to accomplish with the book, it rather focused only on the lifestyle he described in the novel and if he, himself, was actually living that life. The novel would soon take on a life of its own, one he couldn't control, and with the media feeding the fire, he wouldn't become accepted as a serious writer until decades later. No one was interested in the Kerouac who would attempt to tell them that he was the Sal Paradise character of the novel, as opposed to the fast-living, adventurous, and half-crazy Dean Moriarty. They wouldn't listen to him when he told them that he was a French-Canadian who loved America because it had opened its doors to his immigrant parents. They actually thought he was kidding when he told them that he wasn't beat, but rather a strange, solitary, crazy Catholic mystic who wouldn't have been able to write as much as he had if he hadn't lived a monastic life at home with his mother most of the time. That wasn't exciting enough. It wasn't the image they wanted as the face of the Beat Generation. Though upset by the critical attacks on his work, Jack never stopped writing. Immediately following the publication of On the Road, he continued to produce autobiographical books that chronicled the story of his life. The Dharma Bums in 1958, Big Sur and Lonesome Traveler in 1960, Satori in Paris in 1965, and Vanity of Deleu in 1968, as well as several unpublished books of poetry and dreams. He would write and write and write, going on to publish nearly a dozen books after the publication of On the Road. However, alcohol, which had become a habit as a way to deal with fame, success, and stress, would soon get too strong of a grip for him to quit. In his later years, he would slip deeper and deeper into alcoholism, which would unfortunately lead to him succumbing to the consequences brought on by such a vice. Jack Kerouac died from an abdominal hemorrhage on October 21st, 1969, at the age of 47. As usual, I will leave you with one final quote from the King of the Beats. I hope it is true that a man can die, and yet not only live in others, but give them life, and not only life, but that great consciousness of life. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemour Hardin.
We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words. Until next time, keep turning those pages.